we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. This is Multipolarity, charting the rise of the new multipolar world order. Multipolarity listeners will be well aware, given we have covered this over the last month and a half, that events in the Middle East, specifically in Israel and Gaza, and also in the Red Sea, have serious geopolitical implications. Why is that? Well, first of all, because the uh, Red Sea is the narrow entrance to one of the world's uh, key maritime choke points, the Suez Canal, through which a significant proportion of crucial trade travels to and from Europe. In addition to that, one of the key aims of the Pax Americana, the US global dominance, is to use the, in theory, awesome power of its navy to keep such global trading lanes and maritime choke points open, or indeed shut them for adversaries. And now we are seeing the breakdown of that with Maersk and other major shipping lines suspending travel through the Red Sea and therefore through the Suez Canal as well. This will, of course, have serious economic implications. But as Neil Ferguson, the historian and economist, recently wrote on Twitter X, and I assume in his Bloomberg column as well, it perhaps signals the end of Pax Americana. To discuss this tonight on Multipolarity, we've got a friend of the show and regular visitor here, Malcolm Cheyune. Malcolm is a columnist for primarily for Compact Magazine, but he also writes in other outlets. He covers subjects such as US military affairs, European politics, and geopolitical matters. Malcolm also has a a, a famous or perhaps infamous Twitter ex alter ego ego, who posts in rather more strident terms on those matters as well as Japanese manga and other esoteric issues, Tinksorg or these days Sword Mercury. Malcolm, welcome to the show. Please update us what has been happening and what are the real implications of this because I don't think it's been covered particularly well or helpfully in a lot of mainstream media outlets with one or two individual exceptions. Yes, it's it's quite interesting. Like I we, we can start here at the Red Sea. I have seen an increase in coverage of the fact that like there is an actual blockade going on right now. If you think about the Swedish situation, for example, I, newspapers sort of like waking up and going, oh, no ships are passing through the Red Sea anymore, pretty much. I guess this is pretty important. This is going to lead to inflation. And there, there was a similar article, I think, in the Daily Mail or something saying, okay, well, there's going to be a, a crap ton more inflation for us here in Britain if if this situation continues. So there is a growing awareness, but generally speaking, this is treated as almost like an an isolated incident. Like, okay, so a blockade of the Red Sea just happened for no reason. Like there's some sort of pirates, rebels, we don't really know, and they're causing trouble and the Americans aren't doing anything. But as followers of multipolarity will know, having listened to earlier episodes, like the the Ansar Allah, the Houthis, as they're often called in the West, are part of the axis of resistance, which is this sort of alliance structure in the Middle East, with Iran as the primary partner. And the Ansar Allah have essentially signaled their intent to keep blockading the Red Sea until the war on Gaza ends and humanitarian aid is sent to the civilians in Gaza. And recent developments have shown that 
pretty much like the Yemeni blockade is not going to be challenged. Americans initially wanted to pretend like nothing was happening, but then the like ballistic missile attacks on cargo ships became too uh, notorious to ignore, I guess we could say. And then they announced Operation Prosperity Guardian. But Operation Prosperity Guardian was dogged by failure from the start. Uh, very few Europeans wanted to join. Some Europeans joined, but then noisily left, such as France, who essentially signaled that they would not countenance taking orders from Americans. Um, and then there was this attempt to basically open up the Red Sea again. The U.S. Navy and Maersk did some sort of deal where uh, Maersk would, on a trial basis, start transitioning ships through the Red Sea again. But when this happened, the Houthis just attacked the Maersk ship, the Maersk Hangzhou, uh, with more missiles. And now Maersk is out for until further notice. This has led to talk about attacking Yemen and so on, but but to tie this into what you said earlier about like Pax Americana dying, the reason it is dying is because like America doesn't really have the strength to bring some sort of preponderance of force in any one region in the world on a moment's notice. People just assume that one aircraft carrier is this almost incomprehensible amount of military firepower when it's not. An aircraft carrier is a floating uh, airbase that houses 70 ships or something. I don't know what the average air wing is, but it's been shrinking over over the last two decades. And the Yemenis, for example, have been attacked by just the Saudi Royal Air Force has like 450 combat aircraft. The U.S. can't bring 450 combat aircraft to like bomb the Yemenis for 10 years right now. They don't have the resources to spare. And so the U.S. is being challenged everywhere by people who know that like if you can survive the Saudis, you can survive American bombardments. We don't really have to care. And whenever the bluff is called these days, America seems to back down. So there probably won't be a bombing campaign against the against the Houthis here. And this kind of leaves the question open, like what's going to happen now? The US is is signaling that they're essentially going to accept the fact that in the new rules-based order, it's the Houthis who write the rules, not the Americans. Look, there are two ways to look at this. The first is as you said that the that the US simply cannot bring sufficient force to bear to keep the Red Sea open. Essentially, they, they cannot provide a anti-drone umbrella over cargo ships, or they cannot suppress the, Houthi, the Houthis' firing position sufficiently to prevent damaging attacks on private cargo ships. That's kind of one way to look at it. And I guess you kind of presented it in that way in your answer, but the other way to look at it is, is this finally the advent of realism within Washington? Have the, has the Biden administration converted to realism? Are, are they essentially saying that, look, if we get drawn into a broader Middle East war, or even if we have to expend a few hundred cruise missiles and send up a hundred or so FA-18s from a couple of aircraft carrier strike groups, that's going to significantly damage our ability to project project force into the South China Sea, at least into the into the short term, uh, because of the used munitions and the extra mainten- maintenance it'll take to after the air, the carrier strike groups are finished on station in the Middle East. And we have bigger fish to fry at the moment. We're ultimately, painful as it may be, we're going to take the loss on this. We're going to let the Israelis finish off their attack on Gaza. We're going to let things simmer down. And okay, our bases have been attacked in the Middle East. Okay, the uh, Suez Canal was effectively shut for a short period of time, but better that than the alternative. Is that another way to look at things? As has ha, have have realist realist decision making trees 
finally found their way to Washington? Well, I mean, it, if wishes were horses, then beggars would ride. And I wish, I think a lot of people wish that your argument, which is plausible, as long as you don't look at the facts, like a lot of people wish that were true. What the Americans are doing, and here I'm going to use like a technical term, which is strategic cannibalization. And strategic cannibalization is when you take an asset, like an air defense system, for example, and you have a certain sort of task for it, but you're forced to strip it of its usefulness and send it to some other front, for example, where it will do less work but you lack the resources to actually sort of, uh, how do I put this, like maintain proper force posture where you should. So to take a specific example of this, America is currently stripping Japan of Patriot missiles in order to send to Ukraine. This is a huge disaster in terms of, you know, American force posture, because these patriots could conceivably be used to defend Yokosuka Naval Base or Kadena Air Force Base, which are incredibly important, and without which an American war effort against China is doomed from the start. So inside Japan, these patriot missiles do a lot of work for American power in general and American power in the Pacific, in, in the specific. But the U.S. is still taking them and sending them to Kiev, where they will do a lot less work for the U.S. empire, like the imperial position as such. So this is what strategic cannibalization is actually like. The Ukrainians are doing kind of the same. They're taking like reserves and using them to plug holes and so on because they're in a desperate situation. And when you get into a situation where you have to do this sort of cannibalization because of resource constraints. Generally speaking, this also speaks to a breakdown in strategy. Like there's no there's no way to have a I don't think you can make a really good argument for why you don't need to protect protect Kadena or Yokosuka. And like and the Americans are not bothering to make that argument. They're just stripping. They're stripping the assets from the theater, and then they're just going, "Oh well, you know, something will happen that will make this not a big problem." And so, if you see, if you look to the situation in the Middle East right now, the Americans are kind of flying by the seat of their pants. They're they're surging as many resources as they can to the region. They have two aircraft carriers, but one of them, the Ford, has been way over time in terms of deployment. Like it has to go back. They've announced that it will be going back in the coming days. The Americans don't have another aircraft carrier to send. Um, the 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 Stennis doesn't really have a working nuclear reactor right now, so unless the Americans want to draft twenty thousand uh, galley slaves and row that thing to the to the Mediterranean, it, it's going to stay put. the The Nimitz is preparing to be sold for scrap, disassembled, and like the Ford, the 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 upcoming ships in the Ford class have all been massively de- delayed, so. What's probably going to happen, actually, if we put like these two theaters side by side, the Middle East and the Pacific, is that if something kicks off in the Middle East, the U.S. is going to further strip the Pacific of assets and send them to the Middle East, even though everyone in Washington will tell you that this is suicide for the empire. Like They might actually send the... the aircraft carriers that are supposed to police the South China Sea in order to help Israel. So a long, long winded way to say, well, no, uh, there's no strategy here from the Americans. And if you corner someone in Washington and ask them point blank, they will tell you there's no strategy. Like, it's too late for that sort of thing. 
Yeah, it's kind of a situation of everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. And it's not really a a coincidence. It's that the American global system or the empire or whatever you want to refer to it as was not built for a multipolar world. It was built for a unipolar world. And so these naval assets that they have, together with many of their other military assets, are really, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as to call them expeditionary forces, but they're, they're there to go and hit a flashpoint. The world is, is seen to be relatively stable, balanced in terms of diplomacy and everything. And then things can flare up from time to time, and you send the boys in to sort that out. And obviously, that's just gone completely wrong now because, the, because of the shifting alliance system that's been that's taken place in the world. I think this is once again an incident, an instance, I should say, where Multipolarity, the podcast, expected something like this to happen, but didn't expect it to happen so fast. At this stage, it looks like Pax Americana will probably be dead by, by the end of 2024. And of course, that's the kind of geostrategic picture on it, certainly. But that's meeting another almost storm front which is something that I wrote an article about in National Interest over the holidays, which is the change in military technology that's taken place. It's something that we've discussed on the show before. I think we've discussed it with you, Malcolm, on the show before, that the commodification, as I called it in the article, by which I mean, just like you have commodification in any other market, you you start off with a, a very expensive luxury product. You can think of the old smartphones, maybe the Blackberries, or something like that. And then only kind of wealthy people can buy them or people who save a lot of their money. And then as it gets commodified, you can get much cheaper smartphones for under 100, 100 pounds or $100. And that's exactly what's happened in the sort of technology that's required now to enact a naval blockade. The Houthis, I personally, and I don't think we ever have on the show, underestimated their capacities. They're not the Taliban. That's clear. They're much better armed than the Taliban. They seem to have been armed by Iran. But ultimately, the Houthis don't have a navy. The Houthis don't even really formally have a state. They control a region in Yemen. So they certainly don't have the have the economic capacity to generate a naval force. Now, up until now, and I really do mean up until now, we've hit, we've hit a very significant historical threshold. If you wanted to enact a naval blockade, which is a major undertaking uh, allows you to control trade and and engage in a form of warfare that's very kind of high tier in a sense. Up until now, you needed a big economy to support a big navy to do that. You don't need that anymore. The navy, the Houthis have just proved that you do not need a big economy and a big portion of that economy, that national wealth, to be apportioned to support a large navy like the British did or the Spanish did or the Americans do today. You don't need that to enact a naval blockade. All you need is basically a force that can harass commercial ships and send their insurance costs through the roof. Now, this is something that, again, a lot of people have been talking about for a long time. I think it's becoming better and better understood how profound a change it is. And I think we're learning a lot more day by day, in a sense, of how effective this technology is. But people, this isn't the first time that people have talked about it. Large naval assets like carriers have been vulnerable basically since the invention of the kamikaze aircraft by the Japanese. So I guess we're layering on top of a very big geopolitical shift where you can no longer look at the world in terms of flashpoints. You're layering on top of that this massive technological shift that's happened actually probably in the past 50 years, but really in the past 10 or 20. And I think that's where the kind of the very large scale picture, it, it's it's the, these developments are shaking out. They're absolutely insane, really. Can I, can I add something to that? Because you're, you're quite correct here in terms of um, the overall shifts here in military logic. And I think a good way to think about it is Consider carriers in the interwar period, because naval aviation during the 20s and 30s was becoming a thing, and people were forced to sit down and think, okay, well, where is naval aviation going to go? And you had a lot of old-time admirals saying that, well, you know, naval aviation is great because we have all of these big battleships, and now we're going to be able to have like these carriers that can send up planes 
that can find out where the enemy battleships are and tell our battleships and, you know, will have really great reconnaissance for the actual part of the Navy that does the heavy lifting, which is the big ships with the big guns. Carriers, for a lot of people, were just seen as, well, okay, so how do these these things help the battleships? And then suddenly people figured out, and the Japanese were quick at this, and the British were fairly slow, uh, that one of the things that naval aviation did was they made the actual airplanes the striking arm of the fleet, not the big guns. Like, battleships were not really the wave of the future. Like, they were they were fast becoming obsolete. But it was impossible for a lot of admirals to even imagine, like, it wasn't part of their mental model that something else could move in and not be an aid to battleships, but a replacement. And cheap electronics, like all of these Western platforms, like if you think about the workhorses of the US Air Force, which are still F-15 planes and F-16 planes, by and large. These things were made at the time where computers essentially did not exist, other than as this weird like machine taking up an entire room and that you had to be some sort of massive research in university or a government to be able to afford. The When we landed on the moon, the navigation computer for the Apollo project had a whopping memory bank of 64 kilobytes. And this wasn't some sort of like really big 30 nanometer chip or whatever. Like this was a machine that had to be essentially like programmed by hand by people sticking like large copper ropes into like the correct ports to denote ones and zeros. Cheap electronics or electronics in general in terms of like the Western military model, we've had all of these expensive planes designed when electronics was something fairly new. And then whenever there's new cheap electronics miniaturized and so on, we go, okay, well, how will these things help our super expensive platforms that cost, you know, $120 million for a plane or a couple of hundreds or like 600, 2 billion, whatever, for a naval platform. How will these things help our big ships with big guns or big planes with big guns to do better? And like the Yemenis, the Iranians, the Russians, even the Chinese are waking up to the fact that actually you don't really need to try to extend the shelf life of the battleship by ha- building all of these things around it, you, you can actually have the new technology stand on its own two legs. I suppose, therefore, Malcolm, that we're in a situation rather like in the late 1930s and early 1940s, where it could well be that these kind of multi-billion dollar platforms are simply rendered useless. <laughs> essentially in the same way that the battleship was i mean the battleship still had some very very limited uh, utility as far as 1990 in the gulf war but really as the capital ship of choice of blue water navies it, it was done for in the south china sea in 1942 and some of us myself included have been arguing that for at least 10 years now that this would be highly probable to be the case again with aircraft carriers i think when we saw the the i think it was was it called the millennium 2000 exercise in which paul van riper took the red team controls basically iran against the u.s carrier strike group or two u.s carrier strike groups in the the iranian gulf and sank the entire u.s fleet essentially using small boats and and missiles a lot of us have been arguing for a long time that the advent of not just the missile age, but the democratization of missiles, the ability to produce large quantities of accurate enough missiles relatively cheaply, something that's really been augmented by drones as well, 
renders aircraft carriers incredibly vulnerable because although they do have highly effective missile screens, anti-air screens with their uh, missile cruisers and destroyers and frigates, and even though they have decent point defense systems and indeed if they hit extremely good fire control and ability to compartmentalize damage and, and repair damage to the decks, it really doesn't matter if you're talking about a salvo all fired at once of 500 missiles. But I do wonder what that means for force projection, because although the, the, the battleship went to the way it became obsolete in the same way that the longbow did, it was replaced by an air, the aircraft carrier, which could indeed project force over a long distance in the way a battleship could, and could indeed protect sea lanes. Okay, But it seems to me that, the, that, that there's no real replacement for the aircraft carrier that can achieve those ends so in the long term strategically are you know are we going to be left in a position where nobody can control the trading lanes because drones are too ubiquitous too cheap and missiles indeed the same Uh, and in fact some countries with large submarine forces uh, can simply shut down even the most powerful of a blue water fleet's capital capital ships i think that the problem here is that you often with carriers see people discussing like, oh, well, how good are Chinese missiles really? Like, would they actually sink a carrier even if they hit and can they hit and so on? And, and the problem here is that the, the fatal flaw of an American carrier today is not like whether it's going to, you know, crack open like a banana the first, like the moment and Chinese missile graces it. It's that, let's say that the Chinese missile hits the flight deck and leaves a big old hole, but um, the carrier has a ton of reserve buoyancy, and it's mostly fine, except for the big hole in the flight deck. That carrier is sailing back to Newport News, and then it's never going to be repaired because the Americans don't have enough people or money to repair a carrier anymore. Like, their remaining shipyards have are already overtasked and the project of fixing a carrier with a big old hole in the flight deck is something they don't have time or money or personnel for what these what the american sort of strategy here or or conception of military power which is increasing complexity forever has done is that it has hollowed out the American ability to maintain all of these fantastically complex platforms. Like the Americans once, during World War II, I mean, they had individual naval battles where they had 11 carriers of various configurations partaking in that single battle. But but the problem with the the... What I'm trying to get at here is that it's not necessarily that drones have made it so that, like, we live in a completely crazy world where there are no rules and it's going to be like Wild West or whatever. The problem is that, like, the the conception here in the West is that technological development is only a one-way street toward increasingly big battleships with big guns that can only be afforded by two states and that like the only reasonable way to go is to increase complexity and cost if you had a military that didn't put enough like as much focus on complexity and cost and tried to make things that were affordable and scalable, I don't think the US, if it had that kind of military, it wouldn't necessarily be facing a huge challenge in the Red Sea, because it could use that military to land in Yemen and kick the Houthis out, or replace them with a more pliable government. But right now, the US is reduced to sending like its few expensive platforms through the Red Sea launching missiles that cost $2 million a pop to shoot down drones that cost $2,000. This, this isn't the only way that like military affairs could go. 
and it it's not necessarily something that describes Iran. Iran has a ton of small, less capable, less hyper advanced ships of various configurations. It's the same with the Chinese Navy. It has a lot of highly capable ships, but it also has like this entire structure of essentially like second, third line ships that are part of the Coast Guard or something else that it can rely on. So in a world where with new technology, that technology can be used to achieve mass. But the Americans have essentially, and and this is true for the Western world in general, we have completely forgotten about mass. So we we we're basically like the German knights trying to face the uh, uh, the Czechs with gunpowder weapons, rushing the wagon forts over and over because we have all of this expensive armor and crap, and we're just facing peasants, but the peasants have guns, and we haven't thought about bringing our own German peasants with our own German guns to 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 actually have a competition in terms of mass and scale. Yeah, I suppose the question I'm asking, though, is twofold. First of all, it's, it's very clear because of the the economic route that the US has taken, that at present at least, I, I'm, I'm less sold on the idea that they don't have the capacity to do so if they get their act together. But at present at least, the US is struggling to maintain the potency of the military it's created because of the the complexity and its lack of maintenance capacity and its lack of manufacturing grunt essentially it can't produce enough it can't recruit enough and it can't repair enough of, of the assets it needs but my question is really twofold first of all that's not to say that another state couldn't for instance the chinese have what two or three hundred times the shipbuilding capacity of the u.s could they produce and maintain 11 aircraft carrier strike groups, for example, or any other state with a decent enough plan and the will to do so? But the second point is that if these large, complex, expensive assets platforms are now essentially obsolete, how does one protect and project force through around the world and, 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 and protect sea lanes? Because... I, I'm, I'm not sure you could protect a sea lane with a few drones, right? Like yeah, well, I mean, again, the big... When you talk to Americans, where you listen to Americans discuss these sorts of things, and they discuss, like, the, the People's Libera- Liberation Army of China, they go, these soldiers, they're really terrible. Like, they don't have the most expensive body armor, and they don't have the most expensive optics. Like, what are they doing? It's like they're stuck in the 1980s or something. And it's like, well, I mean, they're soldiers, like they're grunts. If you have 200,000 of them, that's going to do more for you in terms of mass than if you have 10,000 of them and they have the best, most great like body armor or night vision optics. Like the American conception of this is just one where eventually you'll have one soldier in some sort of like Gundam or whatever, like personal robot, and he's going to defeat the entire Chinese army because all of these people, like they don't have the super advanced hyper technology. But no, you can't police the sea lanes with drones, but you can't police the sea lanes with 10,000 sailors or 20,000 or whatever. But the American problem here is that this hunt for ever more fanciful, ever more complex, ever more expensive military kit has made it so that they can't actually bring any sort of preponderance of mass to bear. bear. So I don't necessarily think that the, the crisis for the West is going to be felt as hard for a country like China. Because again, if they're facing a problem of someone launching drones or whatever, they could realistically send repurposed fishing vessels with drones or something. But like, if it's a fight about like who can bring a lot of mass, the Chinese are not necessarily going to be slouches. 
in that kind of fight. But the Americans are, and the Westerners are in general, because we scoff at that thing. We say, why should we bring 200,000 soldiers? Why should the British army have a quarter of a million soldiers when we can have 7,000 soldiers and then give them like a super expensive night vision optic? And there's some things... If- yeah, yeah. I, th- I think the way it's going to shake out is from this, and I think what we're going to learn from it is is that you don't, you won't use navies, at least not navies exclusively, to control the sea anymore, or at least shipping lanes. What's being shown here is that smaller countries or even proxy actors of mid-sized countries strategically placed, strategically equipped, can gain control over these things. And so what's effectively going to happen there? I don't think we're going to get the Peter Zahan vision of of piracy, of just constant piracy. And just to remind listeners who may have listened to the Zahan episode, Peter Zahan has not actually been proved correct because he said that the piracy would start when the US Navy receded. But of course, the US Navy has not receded. It's just not able to deal with the uh, quote unquote pirates. So slight miss there for poor Peter Sehan. But I think what's probably going to happen here is that this this will speak to a very multipolar world system. Not to put too fine a point on it, if you want to go through the Red Sea, you pay the diplomatic or other toll that you need to pay. I think that's ultimately going to, how, going to be how it, uh, it, it works out. It's going to be a series of trolls under bridges. And sometimes the troll wants to be paid money, Sometimes the troll wants certain geostrategic goals in the region or whatever. But I mean, that's effectively how it's, how it's going to work out. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of these countries, not, not like the Houthis in Yemen, as, as I said, they don't even have really a country. I mean, they have a region that they control. But some of the more serious countries will probably tie these diplomatic arrangements to bespoke in, insurance arrangements, like shipping insurance arrangements. And if this whole thing looks like a mafia setup to listeners it is and that's how that's how global security works global security is always a mafia arrangement really but the mafia now has got a little bit of competition to, taken into it uh, or will have after after all this kind of settles which as we'll go into shortly could take a little while i just want to use the opportunity here to 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 highlight something that listeners may not actually know about that's been taking taking place in the background of all this and it has to do with the country of Ethiopia. Now, just to go back to August of last year, now that we're in the new year, in August of last year, the countries, the, the new countries to join the BRICS Plus Alliance were announced. And all of them made sense. I'll just recount them again. Argentina, although Argentina has since pulled out because of the election of Javier Malay. Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. Now, Iran was a big surprise because it's so isolated, but on purely economic terms, it's not a surprise. All of those, I would say, are mid-sized countries. The only one with a GDP, uh, purchasing power adjusted GDP below $1.5 billion is, is the United Arab Emirates. So these are mid-sized countries. Now, there was another, and, and, and I should add to that, they all have very obvious strategic interests. Iran is a big oil producer. Saudi Arabia is a big oil producer. United Arab Emirates is, is a key oil producer. And Egypt, while it's not a key oil producer, has the Suez Canal. So all these are pretty important. And if Argentina had gone in, it was a massive soybean producer, that, again, a fairly large country, massive soybean producer that sells uh, uh, a lot of its soybeans to China. So the question was always, why is Ethiopia there? Ethiopia is, an ext- is, a, is a very poor country. Um, it, it, um, it's, it's, it's about $3,700 a year in per capita purchasing power adjusted GDP. That, that compares to 17000 for Egypt, which is the next smallest, for example. So the question was always, why did, why did Ethiopia join? Now, it's a large country. It's the second largest country in Africa by population after Nigeria. But I don't think that was enough to say it. Well, it seems like we're coming to see why they may have uh, joined. Um, Back in early November, uh, maybe a little earlier, uh, actually it was, sorry, it was in mid-October, the Ethiopian prime minister said that he wanted to achieve an Ethiopian port in the Red Sea. Currently, Ethiopia is landlocked by Somalia, Djibouti, which is tiny, and Eritrea. 
And he made this announcement, and basically how people interpreted that, and they were correct to interpret it, was he was going to go to war with Eritrea. And he was going to invade Eritrea, and he was going to take over one of their ports and gain access to the Red Sea. A few days ago, Ethiopia announced that they have formally recognized a country that's not a country called Somaliland, which is a breakaway province in Somalia. And they have recognized this country, and they've also apparently given the the Somaliland quote-unquote government a stake in the Ethiopian Airlines, which is a huge airline in Africa because Ethiopia itself is so large. Big connection spot, everything like that. So they've recognized Somaliland and given them this big share in a major carrier in Africa. And in return, they've got a port or they've got access to a port. So where where am I going with this? Well, now it's starting to shape up what part of this BRICS Plus arrangement's like. If you go to the Red Sea, there are two choke points, the one that's currently being disputed down in the in the southern part near the Horn of Africa and the other in the Suez Canal. Okay, Egypt's part of the BRICS Plus. There's the Suez Canal. Now you go down to the other choke point and you have on the east side, Yemen. Houthi controlled Yemen territory and the Houthis are under the influence of Iran, clearly able to block ships. On the other side, on the west side, is this new Ethiopian slash Somaliland port. I'm not saying that the Houthi uh, attacks on the ships are some sort of a grand strategy by the BRICS to take over the Red Sea. I am saying that there is probably a grand strategy by the BRICS to have enormous control over the Red Sea, which is a key shipping point, obviously, from China to India to Europe. It's it's the, the many of the container ships go from China to Europe. Well, this crisis has accelerated the shakeout of this. And I think what we're seeing develop now is multipolar or multilateral, however you want to think about it. I like multipolar because it fits with the podcast. Multipolar control over key shipping points. This won't be the piracy that Zahan's talking about. It'll be a quasi pay to play system and it'll have very, very profound geostrategic consequences. Just very quickly, for example, I do not. I am not of the opinion that the current blockade in the Red Sea is just to stop Israeli ships. Some people are saying that. I don't believe that. But part of it is to blockade Israeli ships. Well, you can use these geostrategic assets, as they're doing in the Middle East right now, to put pressure on Israel. So I think this is the sort of world that we're, we're seeing shake out. Not the Zahan piracy, but more this multipolar world of give and take, where you have to negotiate and play your geostrategy properly and have all your ducks in a row, as we've been talking about with the correct type of military hardware to use. And really, not to put too fine a point on it, America and the rest of the West is getting caught way off guard with these new arrangements. And they I don't think they even understand many of them. Yeah, that's true. And also, just to make a, a very short final point regarding like this new military technology, in Ukraine, you had stodgy, stodgy Russian like military leadership saying, like, <laughs> you want to tie a, a a 50 year rocket or whatever to to like a children's toy, like a commercial racing drone. I don't see this catching on, if I'm being honest. And then the Ukrainians do it. And it turns out it's a really great idea. And eventually the Russians get wise. And what happens then is that, like, the Russians have a massive inherent advantage over Ukraine, which is this much smaller actor, because the Russians, as the big superpower, can just make a lot more of these drones. So there's nothing inherent about this technology that gives, you know, the plucky underdog an advantage over a massive empire churning out all of these cheap missiles or drones. What's happening to make us weaker is that we're not even part of the game right now because we're still in the (laughs) drones, missiles. I don't see this catching on. Like It's just a fad like the internet. To tie this to what you were talking about, Philip, with all of these security arrangements growing up, like these arrangements will be able to deal with plucky underdog pirates or whatever with drones. It's it's not impossible, just as it isn't impossible for Russia to defeat Ukraine. Um, uh, what, so 
we're not entering Peter Sihan world in terms of like, there's no longer any foundation to have a stable order, like military security. It, it comes down to like a Wild West situation where you are the law, personally, and, and all ships will be using anti-ship missiles or whatever in private hands. That's not going to happen. Like, we're still going to have states being able to offer security guarantees. Uh, the, the, the only shift that's taking place here is that the relative military position of the West compared to the rest of the world is massively, massively being undermined. Right. So I think that's a good point where we can pivot to the uh, the Middle East being increasingly on fire. Obviously, this is completely related to the situation in the Red Sea, but we thought we'd get that out of the way first because it's such a core issue and it's going to have such profound consequences for the world order in the, even in the coming 12 months, but certainly in the next century. So maybe, Malcolm, you can summarize what's going on, quote-unquote, on the ground rather than at sea in the Middle East. Give us an overview of, of how things are heating up or not heating up. Last time I was on the show, we were talking about this sort of undeclared war against the US, mostly. Israel was still slogging away inside of Gaza, but the big story at that time was that the axis of resistance, mainly in Iraq and Syria, were getting involved, inflicting fairly like a, a, a real sticky situation strategically for the US. In some ways, that situation has gotten worse. It's just that, like with the Yemenis in the Red Sea, it's impossible to hide. Like the the the, the strategic crisis is so big that you can't really not talk about it anymore. But like attacks on Iraqi bases have grown more frequent since we last talked. The weapons being used are more. Capable, like they're using heavier drones with heavier warheads and so on. There's, according to CENTCOM, more casualties on the American side coming in these days. So, in some ways, like on the Western Front, nothing new, it's just gotten worse. But the real development since we lost, since our last episode, is that like the situation, the dynamic military and politically inside of Israel has shifted massively. There's now a growing sort of acknowledgement of the fact that Hamas is not being defeated inside of Gaza and that the casualties being taken by the IDF are probably not sustainable for the long term. It really does seem like Israel and and that they're acknowledging this and that this is becoming a point of, of debate, that there's no real viable path to an end state where Hamas is militarily incapable. And what this has done, coupled with the fact that on the the long-term outlook right now for Israel economically, especially seeing as the US seems incapable of opening up the Red Sea again, of actually dealing militarily with the Houthi blockade, like the the long term economic dynamic for Israel is actually quite bleak. It, it's not a country that's capable of being in a permanent state of war slash siege versus the entire Muslim population of the Middle East, um, and so. What you're seeing right now is actually a form of Israeli escalation here against like a whole laundry list of enemies, crossing sort of customary red lines. They assassinated a guy in the Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran that was the main coordinator liaison between Iran and the Syrian government inside of Syria. They've been tamping up the airstrikes in Syria. And they also assassinated a Hamas leader in the middle of Beirut, which the Hezbollah movement has said, like, this is a red line for us. Like, Israel cannot bomb Beirut whenever it wants and not expect escalation. But at this point, it's pretty 
it seems fairly plausible, and people are saying this openly, like, we need to open up a new front against, Hez- against Hezbollah. We need to actually, like, forget about this sort of growing quagmire in Gaza. We can, we can go back, circle back to it at some later time, figure out what we're going to do. But right now, we need another front. We need a second war against Lebanon this time. And the Israelis seem committed to this. They have to worry that if things go on like they're doing right now in terms of the political situation in in America, that sooner or later the Americans are going to force them to discontinue the conflict. So I think that they're in a race against time right now to actually get expand this war in Gaza into a regional war. When the Gaza war kicked off, my sense is that many people in the West, mainly people who are more supportive of the Israeli intervention, thought that this would be a fairly limited operation. Now, I understand why people who just read newspapers felt that way, but I don't really understand why politicians thought that. I mean, it was pretty clear that Hamas were dug in. There was anywhere between 30, 40, maybe more thousand of them. They seemed pretty well equipped. They were in tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. And at the time, I think we expressed our skepticism that it will be a short war. I'm surprised that people bought into that, but they did. And it hasn't turned out that way at all, I think would be fair to say. So I think I think it's probably worth just contextualizing that I think the Western countries, the ones that are more supportive of Israel, I'm talking about mainly the United States and the United Kingdom, are really stuck in a, in a, in a bad spot here. I think they thought that they were supporting an intervention in Gaza that was, would be similar to previous interventions in Gaza, which were pretty limited in a sense. And that's not what happened. And then when, when it escalated further in Gaza and really did turn into a grand operation and so on, they thought, well, they'll clear these guys out pretty quick. They must have a plan. That wasn't true. And now we're sitting here, as you say, that Israel, at the very least, want to escalate with Hezbollah and possibly with Iran. I think we, we saw a, um, a bombing on the day of recording. We don't have the full details of it, but it was a bombing at a memorial service to uh, the General Soleimani, who was killed by the Trump administration. There clearly is this tendency to regional escalation, and I don't think the West knows what to do with it, because I think the big difference between here and the situation that we got ourselves into in, in Eastern Europe is that the West, especially the United States and the United Kingdom, actually understand the Middle East quite well. And they understand what it would mean for this regional war to break out and for them to get pulled into. And perhaps we can talk more in detail about this, but economically, militarily, and politically, the West is not in a position to fight such a war. So maybe that's the direction that we can we can take this. What stands out to you, Malcolm, as being the worst of those three, the trifecta of dysfunction there when it comes to the West just even being prepared for another war in the Middle East, much less a war with a country like Iran, which is substantially larger and more powerful than Saddam Hussein's Iraq was in 2003. I mean, the military situation is a non-starter, honestly. It's like, what are we going to send? And we, here I talk about like the entirety of the West, Countries such as like European countries don't have any capacity for power projection. Like they don't have a ton of sea lift or air lift. They can't move an army division to Iraq or whatever <laughs> and have that army division invade Iran. Like it's not going to happen. And even if Germany had the capacity to move, a division to Iraq, like that division is not going to have any ammunition. Like the Germans are out of ammo. They're out of tanks. They're out of spare parts. They, they have nothing to send. Uh, The French kind of have the ability to at least get their ducks in a row for a charge of the light brigade here, but they're not particularly interested. And, you know, the problem with the charge of the light brigade is you do it once and then you don't have a light brigade anymore. So, like, militarily speaking, it's going to be a solo show for the Americans, but the Americans don't really have any capacity for what I would say meaningful kinetic action. And by meaningful, I mean 
military kinetic action that is pursuant of some sort of strategic goal. What today with American politicians like Lindsey Graham and so on is like the, the a very curious formulation, which is hit Iran. We should, quote, hit Iran, unquote. And I think this speaks to the sort of poverty of, of intellect strategy among most Americans. Because it's like, yeah, you can go up and you can hit Mike Tyson What's going to happen after you do that? Like, nobody can really explain it. Like, the Americans sent this submarine with 150 Tomahawk cruise missiles. And that's like 1.5 cruise missiles per million inhabitants in, in Iran. Wow. Great. So once you fire off, that's like a couple of ounces of, of explosive material uh, per per uh, capita here. Once you fire that off, what's going to happen next? Are you going to take out uh, the the hardened Iranian missile bases with your 150 Tomahawks? This is ancient technology, by the way. Like the Tomahawk stems from, I think, the early 80s, actually. These are subsonic cruise missiles that are not particularly hard to shoot down. I think a normal commercial airliner flies faster than a Tomahawk missile these days. So are you going to take out like the hardened missile bases? They probably have more than 150 missile bases, honestly. And one Tomahawk each is not going to do it. So at that point, what's going to happen after you fire the missiles? Well, they're probably going to fire back. What's going to happen after that? Well, you're going to have a situation where... um, In terms of standoff munitions, the Iranians are allied with the Chinese and the Russians, and they have domestic industrial capacity to produce more standoff munitions. So the balance of forces here in terms of who can shoot the most missiles doesn't favor the U.S. and the U.S.'s commitments elsewhere in the world. And like, you know, the U.S. doesn't have the military to invade Iran. All you're going to do is you're going to have this contest where you fling missiles at each other. And it's probably not one where the West is going to win. So when people say hit Iran, this Uh, is not a plan. This is the absence of a plan. This is underpants gnomes thinking where it's like, we know how to collect underpants and we know what we want. We want world peace and total power. So we have two things, underpants and what we want to achieve. And it's just like the, the, the connection between collecting underpants and ruling the world that we haven't really figured out yet. Nobody in America has figured out the connection between hitting Iran and achieving whatever it is that the Americans want to achieve. But they're working on it. They have the top men <laughs> working busily away at some DC think tank, I think. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Malcolm. And I think it relates back to what we were talking about the Red Sea before. I think the US could do serious damage with conventional weapons to Iran. Really serious damage. It could destroy a lot of buildings and kill people and soldiers and perhaps destroy some military materiel of Iran's as well. But what then? (laughs) Right, it's it, it, it's it's the next stage. It, it, it seems that it, it's exactly the same as the Red Sea situation. Okay, you can attack the Houthis, but what then? They survived pretty ruthless and merciless attacks from the Saudis for what eight years or maybe less, and it achieved exactly nothing. I mean, it created a lot of misery in in, in Yemen, and I'm sure that. U.S. attack on Iran would create a lot of misery as well, but the U.S. simply doesn't have the manpower. It's not going to. It's not going to draft three million men into the military. I mean, even if it could train and supply them, which it can't, but even if it could, it's not going to be politically feasible to draft three, three or four million men into the 
uh, into the U.S. Army or the U.S. Marine Corps anytime soon. And therefore, they're completely incapable of occupying Iran, even if they were military capable of taking it, which is questionable. So, okay, so you've launched 100 missiles and 50 have hit. Then what? If Iran keeps going or the, the, the Houthis keep going or Israel keeps escalating, where do we go from here? I, I, I'm just not sure that there's any kind of strategic thinking. And you might make exactly the same point with Ukraine, although that's a more complicated issue. But it seems that there's a broader failure of strategic thinking. Uh, you know, you get fools like Lindsey Graham, you know, who just say, yeah, we should hit, hit Iran. Yeah, okay, well, what? And, uh, and what? And what then? Right? This is the key question. There has to be a victory. There has to be an end point. There has to be a political aim that's definable and achievable. And I see an absence of that, right? What, what do you think? Five tomahawks landing in Tehran or Qom are going to bring the Iranians to heel? I don't think so. Yeah, the Americans, like Ukraine, at least there was a sort of plausible, I think, like, internally consistent plan here, which is move NATO forward, use this unprecedented Russian aggression to isolate and sanction, eventually starve the beast here of America's like second most dangerous geopolitical rival. Like it, it made sense. There was a plan. There was a connection between collecting the underpants and becoming like the world emperor. Uh, and it just didn't work. Like it was a plan that didn't match with reality. But like the steps were clear. With Iran, there's just like people are throwing like, you know, spaghetti at the wall and just going, well, maybe this one will stick. So one of the the most like I I shudder to say this, one of the most interesting <laughs> American strategies that have been suggested. It's just like destroy all of the oil refining capacity in Iran, like destroy Iran as an oil producer. You know, Philip, you've been following the oil markets, or so I hear. Would you say that removing one of the most, one of the biggest oil producers in the world from the oil markets is a strategy with zero potential? for economic blowback for the West. Yeah, I mean, the oil markets have been so insane recently, they haven't been reacted to anything, and the hedge funds seem to have taken them over. That's a whole different kettle of fish. But yeah, how much um, printing of oil, as I call it, can overcome reality? Yeah, shutting down Iran, and you know, if it bled into Iraq or something like that, and of course, I think the Strait of Hormuz will be closed, which would block, block off... Uh, other parts of the Middle Eastern oil trade. I mean, it would be absolutely crazy, right? Yeah, and and it's like we're going to destroy Iran's ability to export oil because this will hurt Iran. Sure, but oil is a fungible resource. Like there is a huge demand for oil in the world that can't be replaced with thoughts and prayers. And if you take out a massive producer, and people still need to buy that stuff, that's going to drive prices up. And if prices get driven up, it's going to redound back to us. So again, like it's just pure desperation. It's, it's just this, well, if we do something, then that means like fate or providence or whatever has to take pity on us. Even if that something is something that just by the basic rules of economics would crush us rather than like the Iranians, they're not going to lay down and die. And if you take out an oil refinery, like presumably the oil is still in the ground somewhere and it could be sold 10 years from now. You're not, you, you like it's, there is no plan other than what if we point a shotgun in a random direction, such as, you know, at our own head or towards our own feet and just pull the trigger and then watch what happens. I don't really see, like, there could be some sort of conflict with Iran. But, but, but again, one of the problems Americans have, like culturally, is that they're still mired in this um, 
90s stock footage of 20 carrier groups or whatever and some American going, if you fight the United States, someone else will raise your children. We own the finish line. Ura, Semper Fi, do or die. And it's like, yeah, this is like a Russian going, look at Comrade Stalin celebrating the harvest. This is Russia today. It's really not. Like, it's been decades since Comrade Stalin was walking around on God's green earth. And things have changed. The American military at this point is not what it was. The remaining parts of the American military they haven't gotten any younger. Like the, the US has been very unable to sort of replace airframes and ships and so on from the early 90s onwards. So a lot of these platforms are increasingly becoming museum pieces. And there's no money to change that situation. So Americans retreat into this story of America as this hyperpower that everyone is super jealous of and super afraid of. Like it's what the kids on the internet call cope. Like it's it's a psychological sort of issue in the sense that it really distorts any sort of self-conception or appreciation of relative strength between the parties. So someone like Lindsey Graham, he's still living in this sort of goodbye Lenin world where the Soviet Union hasn't fallen and East Germany is still a thing and America is still super strong. While people inside the actual military, they know that like the world's changed, man. Like it's it's not what it was. Yeah, and I think it's worth kind of thinking about the, well, the politics, but the politics are kind of... Um, caught up with the economics. I mean, you've, you you kind of, uh, question about oil kind of starts off the kind of economic discussion. I mean, I think it would go beyond that. Obviously, we've done, we've talked a lot about the Red Sea and we can see what happens. Well, we haven't actually quite seen what will happen, but we can uh, imagine what's going to happen now that there's basically no, as of today, from the map I saw, there's no container ships in the Red Sea. So I assume that's going to give rise to another outbreak of inflation or as it's come to be termed, in both the US and in Europe, a cost of living crisis, which has really, really stretched society thin. Politicians aren't popular at the moment. A, a lot of it is, due, well, it's a combination of the inflation that came on the back of the lockdowns, but I think what really drove the drove the, the stake into the heart of the Western economic system was the war in Ukraine, the rise in energy prices, the disruptions to global supply chains. That's really, really hollowed out a lot of Western economies, they're in complete stagnation, tipping into recession, uh, 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 just coming out of a burst of very nasty inflation, which people have seen with the price of their eggs going up, with the price of their heating bills still being very high. I'm not sure how much more of a beating and a bruising Western economies can take. Can they even take the potential cost increases that may be coming down the line due to the Red Sea debacle? I, I'm not convinced that they can. Another rise of interest rate hikes. What will that do to the finance system? I mean, you can just go down the list. Add on top of that a regional war in the Middle East with Iran, and it's it's borderline unimaginable. And of course, it's an election year in the United States. And even if even if it's not an ideal situation that everything has to be viewed through the lens of an election cycle in the United States, I personally hate that that's the case, that everybody has to change their entire thought apparatus when you enter into the beginning of an election year in the United States, it seems absurd to me, but that is the reality of it. The Americans put huge, huge stakes on their elections. And even beyond the impact that the the economic situation is going to have on the popularity or lack of popularity of politicians, and there aren't very many popular politicians around these days that have been in power since before the Ukraine war, but it's it's beyond that. Because a war in the Middle East has such a bad brand on it. Um, we could go on for an hour about how the war in Ukraine was sold to people, but I mean, the short version of it was it was sold very cleverly and people didn't fully understand what it was because they didn't have experience with that. 
we have plenty of experience with wars in the Middle East, and they're incredibly unpopular. And my sense is, from talking to people, that even people who've been extremely supportive of Israel since the um, the attack by Hamas on October 7th, even those people are very, very reluctant to get behind a war in the Middle East. Because again, we know what that means. We fought a bunch of wars in the Middle East over the past 20 years, and they've been an utter failure. And we know how they fail. So I don't think even people are aware that a war with Iran will be a completely different game because you wouldn't be facing off against annoying guerrillas that won't go away. Although you will also be fighting with annoying guerrillas that don't go away. You'll be you'll be dealing with, a, as you say, a serious, serious military power with a serious missile arsenal and a, and a, and a potentially infinite, I don't want to say infinite, but very flexible means of resupply. And you'll be often fighting from the point of view of a ship, you, you'd have the combined optics of, oh Lord, another war in the Middle East, which is exactly what everyone will say on day one. They'll go into such a conflict exhausted. The public will go into such a conflict exhausted. Now wait till they see that what they see appear in the newspaper won't be a few soldiers killed by an IED in Iraq, as we used to see. They might see a ship being sunk. They might see an aircraft carrier being hit. That's a whole different kettle of fish. If you saw that, for example, in the South China Sea or even in the Black Sea or something, obviously we don't have Western carriers being hit there, thank God. But if you saw that, the optics on it would be, oh, big scary Russia's hit a ship or big scary China's hit a ship. And the optics would be very different to, oh, we just got involved in another Middle Eastern war. We're already exhausted by this entire process whoa, wait a minute, they can sink ships now? I mean, it's crazy. I think people are even having a very hard time wrapping their head around the fact that a small, not a small, but a mid-sized rebel group that look a little bit like the Taliban, even though they're not, are able to bong up a big shipping, shipping, global shipping center. I think people are just trying to wrap their heads around this. Uh, a war with yeah. Iran will be, will be orders of magnitude larger than that. There, there's also a huge thing here. You you mentioned like this sort of growing anxiety even among the supporters of Israel. What people are realizing is that there's a massive sort of uh, failure of communication here between Israel and its putative allies in the West, in the sense that the West has been completely bamboozled by the reality of the strategic considerations of Israel. In the sense that, sure, the Israelis had this, oh yeah, like Hamas, they're going to be easy, like we're going to go roll into Gaza, blow them up with our tanks, we'll all be home before Christmas. Oh no, it turned out into a quagmire. Who could have predicted this? Sure, there was that aspect of like this limited operation where we would take zero casualties because we're the IDF coming to grief, hitting the, the rocky shores of reality here. Like, sure, there's an aspect of that, but that's actually less relevant in the sense that like the Israeli strategic calculus here was never one where it's like, okay, we're going to go into Gaza, we're going to, you know arrest the leaders of Hamas so we don't have a terrorism problem anymore, and then we're going to be done. And don't worry, people in the West, like this this police operation is just going to take a week. No, from the start, the calculus inside of Israel has been, this is probably our last chance to settle regional accounts. People were, I mean, Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, was like from the moment Hamas attacked, urging for an Israeli attack on Lebanon. Then he was shot down by Netanyahu. But like, this is where people are at. America is fading. It's pretty clear. And the Red Sea situation illustrates that beyond any sort of reasonable doubt. Israel's position without, like, the American protector is precarious, to say the least. Time is not on Israel's side. This is the last, like, this is the last call before closing in the bar. 
you either get a regional war now where you defeat Israel's regional enemies or you don't. And so, again, Gaza was always kind of a sideshow from the start compared to settling accounts both on the West Bank but also to the North, which is the big problem here. So the West was convinced, or they convinced themselves, that like the moment the Hamas leader is arrested and put onto trial, like Israel will be done. And yeah, maybe it's not going to take one week. Maybe it's going to take three weeks or even two months. But we can live with that. We can live with this police operation taking three months or half a year. Like that was never the plan from the Israeli side. And they've been pretty candid about that. They've been very candid in their own way about just like once we're done with Gaza or even before we're done with Gaza, we are going to have to deal with not just Iran, but Hezbollah as well. And you guys are coming along for the ride. Like if you don't want the war, we are going to start one and you will be forced to help us. And so people are realizing, like neocons are realizing that, oh no, we're actually like, they're not locked in this room with us. We're locked in this room with them. And they are the ones who are like putting their own sort of strategic interests first. And I'm not really criticizing Israel here or saying that they're, being needlessly belligerent or whatever, like from their own sort of calculus here, it's not viable to have a quarter million like permanently internally displaced like Israelis because the Radvan forces are sitting on the border and saying, yeah, we might take back like the territory you stole from us soon. Uh, you know, you, you like Israel isn't going to survive as a state unless they can re-establish a sort of deterrence versus the rest of the region, and specifically also to let the northern settlers return to their homes where they've been driven, that they've been driven from by Hezbollah attacks. They need to do this, and they need to do this now, and they can't do this on their own, probably. So the West is coming along for the ride. Like, nobody in the West wants a regional war. Israel wants a regional war. And people are realizing that there's a massive mismatch between these two positions. Yeah, and I think here it's worth bringing in the real wild card, the real joker in the pack. Because as we've all been focused on the Middle East, or we've been told not to focus on the Middle East and pay attention to some nonsense, the Taiwanese presidential elections are just around the corner. They are on the 13th of January, which is 10 days out from the day that we're recording this. I think the Thai- the Taiwanese electoral cycle has now gone into the kind of blackout phase where they can't run any more polls and all that kind of thing. And it's a very tight race. The candidate for the the DPP, which is the um, more anti-China party, is uh, showing some lead in the polls. Not much, but three, four points. He has been consistently in the lead for most of the year, although there was a kind of a, a third party candidate splitting the vote in a more profound way. The alternative, of course, is the Kuomintang candidate who... I wouldn't go as far as to call them pro-Chinese, but they are more willing to compromise on the China issue, there's been some saber rattling in news reports by the Chinese saying that the the sort of talk coming out of the DPP candidate, whose uh, name is Lai Xiao, I think I pronounced that right, the sort of talk that he's he's making is fighting words. The Chinese are saying them's fighting words in effect. Now, the Chinese always do this. It must be highlighted. Uh, You can take that with a grain of salt, just like when North Korea makes bellicose statements, they're often to be taken with a grain of salt as well. But the reality here is that we're at a very pivotal moment in history. I mean, there's no other way really to put it. We are seeing the global order being shaken really violently. We are seeing the potential end of the Pax Americana. Taiwan is a is a major issue for a lot of people who focus on the on the Pacific region in America. It is more, I will say, it is more of a strategic worry for the Americans than the Middle East or Central and Eastern Europe. 
definitely. Is Taiwan worth a war? Not probably not in my opinion, but I, you can you can see a logic to it, I suppose. So we're going to get this election on the thirteenth, and we don't really know what's going to happen afterwards. Ideally, presumably, the Americans would like to be in a position where they could intervene if needs be. If the DPP candidate gets elected and does something a little crazy, like declares independence or moves in that direction, and the Chinese get much more aggressive, I mean, we've already seen them do partial naval blockades over, I think it was Nancy Pelosi's visit a few years ago, two years ago, three years ago. Uh, Obviously, they'd like to be in a position where they could, in theory, intervene with carrier battle groups and, you know, the whole nine yards, most of the force of the U.S. Navy. We're reaching a a moment now where the U.S. Navy is already a little overextended in the Middle East, and this election's coming up. I'll bet people are very worried in in Washington. Uh, Before I'll ask your take on it, Malcolm, I'll just say my own. I'm not really sure if, well, I'll say it, this is coming from somebody who thinks that a war with the Chinese will be an absolute and utter disaster, even if it didn't escalate into a full nuclear war, which it could. I think it will be a disaster economically. I think the West would collapse. I think we actually would risk things like hyperinflation and so on, and that these threats are being way underestimated by certain people calling for these sorts of actions. So, Take it with a grain of salt. You're you're getting this from somebody who really, really disagrees with going to war in the South China Sea. So from that perspective, I personally think that the the overstretching probably makes the situation more stable in Taiwan. But there's already always a tail risk that because the situation is so overstretched, we've talked about in pre, uh, previous episodes that the national security apparatus in uh, Washington is so frayed that um, that there could be an overreaction to a statement by the DPP. Or, on the other hand, the Chinese could overreact insofar as they could see it as a moment of weakness for the United States. I personally think the Chinese have too much to lose to do something like that, but we certainly can't rule it out. So to, to throw the joker on the table, what's your take on the Taiwan South China Sea wildcard? I would say that like the situation in the Red Sea has really clarified the weakness of the US in the in the Pacific in in a in a funny sort of way because if you think about like American discussions about Taiwan it's all about like when is China going to launch operation overlord when are they going to have their Omaha beach landing and, and and the Americans say, well, you have to do this. Like, this is the only way a conflict over Taiwan could work out. Because because reasons, like, sieges don't work, which is a funny thing to say, given that sieges are, like, the most effective tactic in warfare and have been since humans have lived in permanent settlements. They've worked the last 10,000 years, and I don't see them not working anymore. Again, like Americans have been hyper focused on like what are we gonna do on D Day? What are we gonna do when the Chinese get triggered by something happening and, and launch their own like naval invasion? But let's just say that the Chinese do what the Houthis do, which is that they progressively ramp up the pressure and say, if you're gonna be a container ship and you're gonna sail to Taiwan we're going to knock you out with our missiles. One of the things that have happened in the, in the Red Sea is that the Navy's total lack of capacity to do convoying and stuff like that, to actually protect cargo ships, has been revealed for all the world to see. The U.S. Navy doesn't really train for that, as far as I'm aware. Like They, they literally don't know how to do convoys. And let's say the Chinese just take this sort of slow strangulation approach to Taiwan. Like, we will tighten the economic noose and we will make sure that you don't get your Funko Pops or uh, uh, soybean shipments until you play ball. The idea that the Americans are going to take out the Chinese missile launch sites or whatever, like that... 
No, they're not. Like, they're not going to stage an invasion of mainland China in order to break the blockade. But again, what we're probably going to see is not so much this sort of denouement that Americans are hyper fixated on, like this mythical retelling of the founding myth of the West, which is the invasion of Nazi Germany through the beaches of Normandy. What we're going to see is basically strategic incompetence, fecklessness, and weakness from the West in the face of an actual concerted strategy on the part of the Chinese. They don't have to play ball with our fixation on D-Day Normandy. And if they don't, we really don't have anything we can do. Like Nobody can look at the U.S. Navy's incapability of dealing with a blockade by the Houthis and say, well, you know, if the Chinese do a blockade, then the U.S. is going to be like Superman and just know instinctively how to break that. Um, And so I think people are just avoiding the elephant in the room here and saying, blockades, schmockades, like who cares? Once D-Day comes, we're going to win. That sort of stuff is no longer relevant. And so an increase in tensions in the Pacific is probably very likely, but it's going to be gradual and it's going to gradually squeeze the Americans out, I think. 